everyone. Welcome to the interview. I am Ciara Pressler, your host, your pregame founder. And uh, we're here to talk to some of my favorite creators, innovators, and game changers. Whew, for today, I'm going to have to take off my sweater uh, because our guest today is Laura Haddock DiCarlo, founder of Laura DiCarlo, one of Oregon's fastest growing tech startups. Laura DiCarlo, which develops and markets robotic consumer products for women's sexual health and wellness. Laura is the inventor of OSE, Laura DiCarlo's flagship product, which holds nine patents in micro robotic technology and was a CES 2019 Innovation Awards honoree in the robotics and drones product category. But when the award was redacted, Laura opened the public conversation about gender bias and inclusion in the tech industry and worked with CTA to update their policies for 2020. Not only that, she's come back to win two additional awards in robotics for her newest products, Onda and Bachi. We will be talking about this. Uh, Laura sits as a board member for the Technology Association of Oregon and is also involved in Tao's Diversity Initiative Working Group. To date, she has raised $6 million for her company and has even received government funding from the state of Oregon. I love that our tax dollars are going towards women's sexual health. Um, Laura is an internationally sought after speaker and has appeared at events including the Forbes Global Women's Summit, uh, South by Southwest, Tech Open Air, Tech Crunch Disrupt, and Women in Tech, among many others. Um, and she has been listed as one of the top women disrupting health tech by Forbes. How lucky are we to have her here with us today. Laura, welcome to the interview. Thank you, Sierra. How lucky am I? What are you talking about? <laughs> we have just become friends this year, um, which is fortunate through Oregon Entrepreneurs Network and Amanda Oborn, who is the executive director there. And I think we, we were on a panel together um, talking about, I don't remember even what the topic was, but <laughs> we were talking about tech and entrepreneurship and diversity because those are the topics right now that we're all talking about I actually no remember we weren't talking about diversity and then and you and I made that a very very focal point very quickly yeah you're like yeah, wait a second was, let's let's just unpack this for a minute right because it was us and then I think um another entrepreneur who is also you know a white straight male and um you know these topics come up in this industry, which we will get into. Um, so you are uh, in Bend, Oregon right now? I am, and it's beautiful out here, and you should definitely come visit. I will. Um, I think people outside of Oregon or the Bay maybe don't realize that Bend is like this very, like, up-and-coming, like, really big startup community of its own. There's a lot of uh, venture capital moving through Bend right now. Tell us a little bit about the scene there. There's actually, um, there's a lot of Silicon Valley that has uh, transferred up here. Um, I know my father's out in Reno. I grew up in Silicon Valley. I grew up in San Jose. Oh, wow. um, and I, I know that like pretty much everybody that's like, everybody's like jetting out of San Jose and jetting out of Silicon Valley and they're popping other, over to Reno and here apparently. Um, so our population actually, I haven't checked it recently, but um, we were seeing um, over nine new people a day moving to Bend um, in the last year or so, which is, is kind of crazy if you think about it. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the community here is very, um, you know, very tech forward, um, actually very inclusive, very thoughtful. Um, and it's, um, and I think it's just because it's this adventure haven. Um, I am a rock climber. I'm a kiteboarder. I am a mountain biker. I'm a skier. And you can do all of that here. You can't kiteboard right here. That'd be really cool. But um, you can do it not too far from here up in Hood River. So um, a lot of these folks that, uh, you know, did well in Silicon Valley, um, you know, they also understand, uh, you know, if you've been through it, you understand how much your mental health is uh, very important. And for a lot of people, I think that means, you know, getting outdoors and this is a great place to do it. It really is. Bend is the closest thing we have to Colorado, which I think is the closest state to Oregon in terms of landscape and, and uh, friendliness to outdoor activity and, and health. Yeah. 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 It's, it's gorgeous. And the, the skiing here is fabulous. Like I said, you'll have to come out. 
I, I don't I, ski, but I will totally wear a cute outfit in the lodge and wait for you. We should do that. <laughs> I, yeah, it's, it's, they, they make really great. What's it called? It's um, like spiced wine. Oh yeah, the hot drinks. You gotta yes. have the hot drinks yeah. in the winter. Yeah. Um, speaking of mental health, um, well, I know a little bit about how your COVID lockdown has been, but before we were all quarantining, you had some firsthand experience, yeah? Yeah, I did. I was actually a keynote speaker at the Women in Tech Conference in Stockholm, Sweden, uh, in the very beginning of March, and I was also speaking at some events in London as well, and um, the end of the night, uh, when we were doing our big uh gala so to speak at uh and the the networking party after um this conference i was speaking at my assistant was with me and she's like i just don't feel good and i was like oh let's get you home like let's get back to the hotel and it turns out she had it and then i i ended up getting it and i'm, I'm betting we got it at that event or i got it at that event there were hundreds of people there people were not it was not a big deal then um, so we came back, we rushed back to uh, Bend and back to Oregon. Uh, it turned out I was actually the second person in the county to ever get it on record. Um, and it was, it was insane. It lasted 37 days. Um, it was the most intense, um, awful, terrible, like, sickness experience I've ever had. And I got, when I was in the Navy, I was quarantined for swine flu on suspicion of swine flu. So um, in... I've never experienced anything like this. It was absolutely awful. So you mean it's not a hoax? <laughs> I was probably just the flu, you're right. Yeah, probably just no big deal. Everyone just go to a party right now. Right. Yeah, when I, you know what, right now as people are very antsy and you know, we've been inside and we, life is not normal um, and maybe never will be again, you know, I'll, you forget. And I, I definitely err on the side of caution, but you know, every so often, I might do something sloppy and what I do is I go online and I read firsthand stories of people who actually had it because, you know, right when you think it won't be that big of a deal, man. Right, exactly. And I think um, I actually found out, so everybody's always been like, you know, for the past few months, they're like, oh, you, you got it. So you're immune. And then I see somebody like post a, to Instagram, like I got COVID and I just got COVID again. Very two separate, very separate incidences. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not, uh, I take it very seriously. And I take it very seriously with, with my team. I know we talked about having you come out here and stay in my little, my little tiny house down the street, which is like right here on the river. And so just as an update, one of my employees, one of my engineers, her roommate got po was positive with COVID and she'd been exposed. So I grabbed her and uh, the person that actually, she just bought her new house. So she's actually out of that tiny house. So that was open. We put Maisie in there and um, uh, you know, turns out she was actually negative uh, for COVID. We had her tested and everything, but her roommate ended up, um, she's younger and she was like, oh, I'm fine. And then all of a sudden she's in the hospital. Mm -hmm. and um, people are not taking it seriously enough. I actually just got a message the other day from, from her saying, hey, can I move back into my, into my place with my roommate? And I was like, is she negative? Is she completely asymptomatic for at least 10, 10 days? And she's like, and she sent me a, a, mess, a screenshot of a message with this person that says, you know, oh, the county told me I can go back to work because I'm asymptomatic now. And I was like, she was in dire, like, like a very very intense symptoms five days ago that is not what the cdc says if you've had symptoms and like the only way you're going back to work is if you have been completely 100 percent asymptomatic for 10 days and it's just this misinformation miseducation um and people are are going back to work um or they're going back and they're doing you know they're getting back into spaces and they're infecting more people and this is it's a problem it's a, it's a crisis and, um, you know, obviously everyone's going through it on, on different levels and, um, and, and we all have so much sympathy for those who have uh, lost jobs, been laid off, been furloughed um, and are struggling with that. Um, but, I, you know, I just want to call attention here because a lot of our community, our entrepreneurs, it is very hard to be a boss right now. I mean, 
you don't have this huge corporation. How do you run your company when you get COVID? You know, how do you take care of your staff when they get COVID and they can't show up? Yeah, um, that, I was terrified when I got it. I mean, 37 days is a long time for a CEO to be gone. Um, luckily, we've uh, implemented the right kind of in infrastructure. We now have a team of 30. Um, and actually, we, we've just hired, uh, done a round of hiring recently um, in order to do our next scale. Um, and, uh, but at that point, I think we had 22 people on staff and I'm, I'm fortunate enough that we were able to hire the right kinds of people. They're doing their jobs very well. Um, I have an amazing team. I am, I am absolutely blessed. And I don't say that often unless it's my team because they're an amazing group of people. Um, they, held, they held things together. And actually, by the time I was actually up and running and back, they're excited to see me, of course, because I, uh, from a CEO standpoint, you know, the CEO title and job description is actually very different for every individual at every different kind of company. It's not the same thing at every company. And a lot of people, it's kind of a misnomer. Um, you know, my job is actually very outward facing, uh, you know, direct, direct to consumer. I, I talk to a lot of our, cons our customers. I do a lot of the outward facing, like the interviews, uh, the talks and, and whatnot. So, you know, all of the operations had actually been pretty battened down and I got back and they were just excited to see me. And I was just like, like, thank God, everything's fine. Everything's okay. And we were actually humming. Um, that was right around the time that we ended up getting the, um, the stimulus package that went out. And we joked that it was kind of the stimulus package for stimulation because we saw an uptick in sales that week, I can guarantee you. I love that. And what a great way to spend your stimulus money. Right. <laughs> yeah, I just, you know, it's what a great health, business. Health and wellness, trust me. <laughs> for sure. Mental health, physical health, all the health. Um, you know, it speaks, it speaks to uh, the importance, too, of hiring the right team so that if you disappear, if you have to be taken out uh, um, of the game for a little while, you got to have a team that can keep things running without you. Yeah. And, and it's, I think, um, you know, probably TMI, but I do have a therapist. I also have an executive coach. I love my therapist because, and if you don't have one, I highly recommend it. If you think you don't have problems, you probably do. Um, that being said, I, I was talking to her about this this morning, actually, about the, the fact that I, you know, I have all of these folks um, and that it's not on, on this team and they're amazing, but I also take like, if you have turnover or if you have, like, if you have this idea, this idealistic, like, description of what you're supposed to be doing in your head, like, you're going to be disappointed. If you think that you're not going to lose people, you're going to be disappointed. It's not perfect. It's never going to be perfect. Being an entrepreneur, running a business is never going to be perfect. And you need to get that out of your head right away. Um, because I am a perfectionist at my core and I struggle with that on a daily basis. And, um, you know, we talked about how, you know, uh, you know, there are going to be employees that aren't going to be 100% happy. There is going to be tur turnover. There are going to be people that just don't like you. And you need to be okay with that. And, uh, and really hold on to the good ones. And I am very fortunate to have a lot of good ones right now. And you need to be okay with not being 100% sure about uh, some of your decisions and about being in the game at all, right? You know, <laughs> um, I had a client say like, I just don't know if I can do this. And I was like, like, give me a percentage. And I'm thinking she was going to say like 90%, like she just doesn't think she can do this. And she said 25%. And I'm like, oh, that's just normal. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like welcome. Yeah. Welcome to the game. Right. It, it, that cracks me up because I, I do this on a daily basis. And actually the one thing that helps us to make those decisions, those harder decisions, um, is, is always encouraging our team and myself uh, to make our decisions based on our values. Because I really honestly believe in our values are respect, empowerment, and integrity. And for us, that, that creates a really inclusive culture. And, uh, you know, I always say if you make a decision based on your values, it might not be the most profitable decision. It might not be like the most, like the thing that you're going to get the, the best result from, but it is always going to be the right decision. Um, and that's, that's how we kind of tackle everything. And, and always with this bias towards action. Like if you sit back and you go, oh, well, I'm going to wait until I get all the details. Guess what? You're never going to get anything done. So true. Yeah.
Well, uh, speaking of getting some things done, you have some really prominent launches that you're in the midst of. So tell us about the new product. Um, so we actually have a brand new product. We started out with Osei, um, which was our first, our, our hero product, which is actually, it creates a, um, or it recreates the experience of having a blended orgasm where you stimulate the G-spot or the urethral sponge on the inside and the clitoris on the outside and you get this like mind-bending orgasm. And that was actually the, um, the, the impetus, the, the, what like really kicked off the company. And then what we did last year is we actually surveyed over 1500 people and we asked everyone, Hey, what kind of sensations do you like? How do you like to be touched? What does it feel like? And, and everybody, uh, there was this chorus everywhere and they're like, we love clitoral stimulation, oral sex, all of it. And so we're like, okay, so we actually have a product that, that does that does that. So we actually took that function that utilizes biomimicry or the mimicry of human motion. So it actually is supposed to feel like, like cunnilingus. And we, we took that and then we just, we like upped our ante as much as humanly possible and we tested the crap out of it. And now we have this absolutely amazing product and it's called Bocce. And it means kiss in Italian and that's exactly what it feels like um, and it has this cute little cap you take the cap off and it's super simple to use it actually fits within the external labia for a really really snug fit up against wow. the vulva and over the top of the clitoris and what that also does is that that cup actually fits very like right up against the clitoris and the clitoris is actually about the same size as your hand and so it fits right in between uh, the crura and the the vestibule and then you get this like it, you're stimulating the whole clitoris instead of just the glands on the outside and it's amazing. I am gonna have to do some hard-hitting journalistic research this weekend um, because I want to bring the truth to the people so thanks. <laughs> Um, okay, I need to understand how we got here because I don't really know your backstory very much, but I heard you say you were in the Navy. I mean, my bias is like, oh, someone has a sex toy company. Maybe she worked in the adult film industry before this because also you're yes. gorgeous. So I wouldn't, you know, my bias, I wouldn't think like, oh, she was in the military. <laughs> so right where did you grow up did you, you you don't go to college for you know sex toy development so how did you get here no you don't and actually um that, there's another imposter syndrome that i'm uh, like i would tear myself apart because i never actually finished my degree i i went back to school so many times um i went i went to school i was i was working like four jobs when i was in junior college i didn't even apply for university because i didn't think that i could get in even though um you know i had it's just, I mean, it's the way that a lot of female and femme facing people are brought up is just like, you just can't, like, you're not good enough. And that's where I was. So I didn't apply for university. I'm working four jobs and going to jun or junior college. And I decide at some point, I want to be a nurse. I want to change the world. So I go and I apply um, for the Navy thinking, you know, I, I can't get into the Peace Corps because I don't have a degree. So this must be the next best thing. And they pretty much tell me, oh, well, you get a 97 on your ASVAB and you score through your roof on mechanical and mathematics testing. So no, you don't get to be a nurse. And I was like, you're going to tell me no? And they're like, no, you have to be an, a nuclear engineer. And I was like, you're going to tell me no? <laughs> All right, fine. So I went and I applied for a full ride scholarship and I got it. I was amazed. I was absolutely blown away because again, I'm sitting there thinking you're not going to get that. And so I went to school to become a Navy, a Naval officer as a nurse officer. So that's uh, kind of where my, where my career in healthcare really started. Um, I came out two years later to go home and on an honorable discharge to take care of my mother um, and uh, found myself in this dead end job, um, you know, starting up a brewery, which, you know, it was a great fun project, but not for me. And just going, I really, I want to go back to this. So I decided to uproot myself again and I moved to Portland and I started going to uh, finish up my pre-med and uh, uh, go to med school to become an orthopedic surgeon. So I get a few years into that and I realize I still have 11 years to go. Wow. And this is not exactly the career that I had picked 10 years ago. 
this is, you know, healthcare is changing, the money is going through the floor, the paperwork is going through the roof, the autonomy I wanted as a physician or a surgeon is now out the window, and I don't even really get to spend time with patients. What's the point? So I started thinking about, okay, what, what can I do that, that really can help change the way people, like, interact? How can I change the world? And I had no idea. And right around this time, I'm single, I'm dating, I'm dating couples, I'm dating women, I'm dating men, and I have this orgasm. <laughs> I literally, like, like, I lost my mind. I hit the roof. I, no, I literally hit the floor, actually. I literally squirmed and shuddered off the side of the bed and, like, <laughs> smacked on the floor. I had, like, one leg hitched up on the bed. My, my back is on the cold linoleum, and, cold tile, and I'm just going holy shit, how do I do that again? <laughs> and I'm looking at this partner and I'm like, uh, how do I do it again by myself? <laughs> and I really was like, how do I, like, why can't I do that? Like, why can't I have that power? That felt powerful. I want that. And so I started looking for a product that would recreate that experience. And it didn't exist. I was buying these things that were supposed to fit me. And we're supposed to elicit this kind of like, you know, this, you know, G-spot and clitoral orgasm. And I was like, but they didn't. And they didn't fit me either. None of them did. They would like, they were too big, they were too small, they'd slip out, they didn't, like, whatever. And so I started looking for, I was like, okay, well, there's got to be a way to make something like this. Just because I am morbidly curious. I'm, I'm such a weirdo. I'm like, I'm, I decided one point in my life, I was like, I'm going to learn how to raise chickens and build a chicken coop. I built an eight by 10 foot building out of used pallets and it looked like a freaking chicken palace. Like this is the kind of shit I do. So um, I'm very, very creative. Got to build stuff with my hands, draw it out. And so I start drawing this out and okay, if I want this to work, I need data. So I went to, I went back to school and I started looking through all my medical journals, through all my texts, the data that I needed didn't exist. They oh never, nobody's ever written it down. I'm like, how does everybody, how do we not know like where the clitoris is for most people? Well, I think we, we can answer that question because who's been in charge? And, right. ha, you know, not true of everyone, but most of them don't know. Yes. So, I mean, you, uh, don't even get me on that, that avenue. I will go so far down that freaking path. Um, so I start asking people like, can you tell me where your glands clitoris is? Can you tell me where your, where your G spot is? I'll help. And, and I start realizing all of these people have the same reaction. Every single one of them is like, Ugh. oh my God, I'm so awkward and embarrassed. You're asking me this right now. And then like right after that, they're like, oh my God, but I'm so curious. Nobody ever talks to me about this. Can we talk about it some more? And, and then I'll notice that every single one of them was like, how do I find it again? Where is the spot on me? And I had to teach nearly everyone. I was drawing diagrams, like talking people through it on the phone. I had a girlfriend of mine call from Seattle and she's like, hey, um, so I'm in the bathroom. I'm completely naked. And what am I supposed to do again? And I was like, oh, girl, hold on a second. Just FaceTime me. And, oh, don't FaceTime me. I will talk you through this. God. Ah, and that's a true friend, right? So, and then the last thing is everybody obviously wants to know why I'm asking. And I start talking about, well, there's a blended orgasm that I had. And I think that there is, I think I could make something that actually elicits this orgasm and helps to recreate this experience for other people. Because to be honest, I was also trying it on like women I was dating and I was like, okay, it's not just me. It is not just me. Um, and so that's when I realized there was a market for this product. And so one evening I, you know, a couple margaritas in with some friends of mine who were exited entrepreneurs, something I know nothing about at the time. Um, I'm telling them, I'm just, I'm bitching about sex tech. I'm just like, you know, like, like it could be so much better. There's not enough technology involved. There's not enough like physiological research involved. And they're like, sounds like you have like an idea for a company. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the first thing about starting. I'm a nurse. Like, come on. No, no. And I keep talking. And they're like, no, seriously, it sounds like you have an idea for an invention. And I was like, I've never invented anything in my life. And I, I'm not an inventor. But if I was, this is what I would do. 
Right. And I started listing off like, like what I would do in order to solve this problem and how I would engineer it. And, and they're both looking at me like I have two heads and I'm like, what? And they're like, if you do that, we'll help you figure out how to get your seed round and get funding and get started. And I was like, no, I'm not doing that. No, that sounds terrifying. I have no, just no. Six months later, they're still bugging me. And um, they're asking me for a pitch deck and I'm like, I don't even know what a pitch deck is. Like, what is a pitch deck? I haven't done PowerPoint since I was like in college, come on. Um, and so they're like, just show us how it works. So I get this whiteboard and I prop it up against the wall and I start drawing what the female anatomy looks like. I start drawing what clitoral anatomy looks like, how it changes from person to person. And then I start inserting, no pun intended, what the product could look like and how that could change and how it could be customizable to be able to fit individual bodies. And then I start talking about, and I don't even know what the term channel strategy is at the time, but I start talking about it. Um, and then I get to the point where I start talking about why something like this is important, why something as innocuous as a well-developed and designed tech for sexual exploration could help change the conversation and move the needle forward for, for, uh, for gender um, inclusion mm -hmm. and help people feel more comfortable in their own skin. And they're both looking at me again, like I have two heads and I'm like, what? And they're like, that was a pitch deck. And I was yeah, like, exactly. Oh, I guess we're starting a company. And I, wanna, I wanna pause here as the teachable yeah. moment because anytime you know you do a talk or a panel on entrepreneurship and like how to do it, you know, the the advice is solve an actual problem or follow your curiosity or figure out what you need that doesn't exist in the market yet. And I think people, it's such an abstract idea, but this is such a good, tangible, real world story mm -hmm. of somebody actually doing that. And you don't have to have a business degree or, you know, perhaps if you had had an MBA, it would have worked against you. It's, it's possible. I mean, I was just I, like, and I think that um, since then, just to like jump way forward, I am working on the the beginnings of writing a book right now. And I've, I've been doing most of like my keynotes this year have been around um, what I call the altruistic agenda. And it's based in curiosity and empathy and uh, integrity and curiosity being the very first, like just like utilizing that curiosity and using in altruism as your vehicle um, is, is how we are looking at business differently as mo like how I see most women and femme facing folks and people in the LGBTQ community, um, really approaching business in a very different, in, in a very different way than we have, um, than most males have in the past. And I see a lot of males adopting that as well, but, um, it's, it is about, it's about, um, you know, really grabbing onto that curiosity and seeing where it takes you. And, and I was frustrated with myself because I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. But at the end of the day, all I, I like in a frustrated manner, just end up going, this is what I'm doing. And they went, that's what we were asking for. And I was like, oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. it doesn't have to be that complicated. No. I mean, I love that, that the touch points of this conversation are, you know, health, equity. You know, I, we don't think of, you know, sex in those terms always, but absolutely it is. And, and I think through COVID, being somebody who's single and mostly quarantined by myself, you know, have realized, you know, sex is part of self-care too. Yes. And so having a really nice instrument to help you with that self-care is really important too. And there's a lot of really cheap and shitty project, products out there yeah. that aren't really helpful. And it's like, why would you put that inside your body? I know, I know. I actually, like I said, I talk to a lot of customers, like personally, I will, I'll reach out to them and be like, Hey, let's like have a conversation. Like if we even positive, negative feedback, um, somebody that's never bought a product before, I try to touch base with somebody at least once a week. Um, and when we first launched, I think I touched base with nearly 60 people and, and it was in truly enlightening. Um, and, uh, actually just talked to a woman who was like about 60 years old just the other day. 
and she's also she's an she's an artist in her own right she's an author in her own right um her name's kathy kimichek foley and she said the most awesome thing and i was like can i quote you on that she said well that's where the revolution is honey it's in the bedroom that's where it starts and she's 100% right. Like that is where it starts. Like having, finding that comfort within your own body, within your own skin and allowing, like understanding how that connects to identity and your, your comfort within your own identity and how that can actually influence your confidence when you go out into the world and empower you to do great things. It's all connected. And so, so that's connected. where we start. Yes. So anyway, so that's when I founded the company in, in 2017. Um, and uh, I ended up, I talked to a couple of engineering firms, but I ended up at Oregon State University mm. talking to Dr. John Parmigiani, who is the uh, director of the MIME lab at their college of engineering. And they happen to be the top four robotics graduate program in the country. So um, I ended up with this really cool um, uh, industry funded research program by, by Laura DiCarlo that um, with anywhere between two and nine uh, student engineers working on the project at any time. And nine months later, I have five patents pending. I have, uh, I have a prototype. I have proof of concept. And that is what we took to CES. That is what we went, went and applied for a robotics and innovation award at CES. And then we got it a month later, which was mind blowing, especially for my team, because it was mostly made up of it, like we had a very queer centric uh, trans woman, um, myself, a couple of young female engineers um, all working on this project. And we're like, oh my God, do you see me? You see us? You see what we're doing? You see the importance of this? Yeah. And then they took it away a month later. Okay, and they called so me. For, for those who don't know what CES is, Consumer Electronics Show, it's like the biggest convention of the year in, uh, in Las Vegas every January. This is the mecca of the tech world entrepreneurship. This is where we hear the announcements about every piece of tech that we now own. It's massive. And so just going at all is a big deal, but to win the award is massive. Yeah, yeah it's, um, they have over 200,000 uh, attendees every year there in person, probably not next year, they're going digital, obviously. Um, <laughs> almost 5,000 exhibitors and if you get an award, it, it can make your company. So we got one. It, we were like, holy shit, we might, we might make it. And cause that's what you're always thinking. Am I going to make it yeah. when you're an entrepreneur? <laughs> and, and so we get this award and um, then we start applying for exhibitor space uh, because it turns out if you get an award, they're like, oh, if you want to be in the showcase, you got to spend money. <laughs> and, and we're like, oh shit, I don't have a lot of that. So um, I had to start going out and fundraising, raising money in order to uh, support the booth, which is like a $40,000 buy-in to start. Um, and then our PR efforts, our marketing efforts, we hired our first marketing person who was just like, holy shit, what did I get myself into? Um, and so, and then a month later, after I've already put all of this underway, uh, we get an email from them saying, oh, we're sorry, you're an adult company, you can't exhibit. And we're like, we're sorry, we got an award, we have to exhibit. Like, so we go back to the people that gave us the award and we're like, can you help us work this out? And they went dark for like three days. And and suddenly we get an email that says, we're sorry, but this has gone up the chain of administrators. This spawned a very big conversation and we are revoking your award on the basis that we believe that it is uh, obscene, uh, immoral and profane. And I'm like, oh really? In 2019. Yeah. And yeah, and I was like, this is, this is not a good time for you to be overly patriarchal and, and just like spouting gender bias. You have products like this at your show for men. And this is so indicative of the tech industry at large because it's, you know, innovation, innovation, innovation. But when it comes to, you know, a product that's going to benefit women, benefit, you know, um, LGBTQ people, it's, it's a whole different narrative. And that's, that was, so we started doing a lot of digging and research and we found that, you know, there were other companies that like made products for women that won awards. You know what they were for though? You know who they benefited at the end of the day? The child, the partner, somebody else. 
but never just just never just like the person with the vagina or the femme facing person wow. it was never about them it always it was a vacuum cleaner it was a child's toy it was a shopping assistant mm -hmm. um it was it was cookware whoa so you can make food for your family but not never anything that really just benefited us and um so we called that out as being biased. We also called out the fact that they had a VR porn company for men there on the floor. And I had a friend of mine that went there. Wow. And they came back and said, so they asked me if I wanted to try their product. And they said, hey, do you want to try the female perspective or the male perspective? And she was like, oh my God, how progressive of you. Let me try the female perspective. And she goes and she puts on the headset. And what does she see? Two chicks getting it on. What? That's what every woman wants, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, okay. Some yeah. of them do, but I'm pretty sure yeah. like a lot of women are like, that's not really my bag. Mm -hmm. Um, and they, there was an, like a robot there that it was uh, one of those female, like a sex doll that was literally just a tits, like tits and a head. And you could change your hair, you could change your face, you could change your accent. She would tell you how amazing you are. And then she'd suck your dick. And that was giving interviews. <laughs> In 2017 on the floor it was it actually like, like my dating life my and i'm like <laughs> but uh, my shit's profane uh, that that's a theme oh okay so we we really pushed them to reconsider and they wouldn't so we took all of the evidence that we had masked and we went public with it the day that ces started in 20 for you yes and we drowned out all their news. We became a bit of a overnight tech sensation. Um, I became an overnight motivational speaker and I was speaking it. I went from like, just like dicking around in the lab with my engineers to um, speaking at Forbes in Israel and like nearly wetting my pants and just like, okay, I guess we're doing this thing. And I love it. I love being on stage. I love doing that. I love having that touch point with people. And that's actually helped mold my job and my job description as a CEO is, is being that person, being able to have that human touch point and actually go out and talk to people and understand what their pain points are. And that has actually become our model um, as a business. And that's how we operate. But um, about a couple, a couple of months after that, um, we actually had the CTA come and send us an email and they're like, can we talk? So we discovered that they actually were thinking, they apologized thoroughly. And they were like, we should have never done that. Um, and they wanted to give the award back. And we said, let's do one better. Let's do something better that's just, not just for us, but for everyone in sex tech because sex tech deserves to be at the show. There's nothing that is immoral about it. There, um, there are plenty of ways to do this in a very tastefully done, respectfully done manner that doesn't objectify human bodies, that is innovative and it is solving problems. So let's allow it to be at the show. And so we rewrote their policies and allowed sex tech to actually exhibit at the, sh at the show. And I, we went this last year and it was absolutely mind boggling. It was really cool to see everybody there. Um, and, uh, and it was done very nicely. Did, um, you know, I, what an amazing PR story of turning lemons into lemonade, but also not just doing it for yourself but having altruism involved where you're helping other companies as well, I, I would imagine, including your competitors. Yeah. And, and actually that's, and I, I talk about that often actually is we're one of the few industries where there is a, a large quantity of us that, you know, that we are competitors, but we realize that sex tech has a long way to go. It is super stigmatized. It's shamed. Um, and it is, it's not just sex tech, it is sexual health and wellness. It is health and wellness. And we realize the importance therein. Therefore, we work together because we realize that all ships rise with the tide. We're like the only way we're gonna move this conversation and move the needle forward is if we actually work together. So um, just as an example of that, shortly after all of this happened with me last year, um, there's another company called Lioness and they make a, um, a rabbit vibrator that actually takes in uh, biometrics and shows you what your orgasm looks like digitally. <laughs> it's really interesting. And her name is Liz Klinger, the CEO. And she was actually exhibiting at uh, the Women in Tech uh, show in San Francisco put on by Samsung and somebody complained and said this makes me uncomfortable so they kicked her out in the middle of the show in the middle of the show and she calls me that evening and she's like do you have somebody I can talk to I think that I want people to know this happened 
And I said, are you fucking kidding me? I will loan you my entire PR team for a week. Let's get this out there. And we got it plastered up on national and international news again. And that happened several times last year where, um, you know, people were, were being censored for things that we shouldn't have to be censored for. This is education. I mean, we know for a fact that, that America in the world, period, I mean, our sexual education is terrible. And we do, as entrepreneurs, particularly in this space, recognize that, like, the bill falls to us. We are responsible for a lot of that. And as a company, Lorda Carlo actually takes a lot of that responsibility right onto its shoulders um, and, uh, you know, really tries to deliver a lot of that education um, because you just can't get it in, in the system. As someone who didn't plan to be an entrepreneur, um, what have some of your <laughs> biggest lessons been uh, along the way? Um, that I can't do it all. And perfection is a myth. Um, and also, motivation is a myth. Like, motivation just doesn't come to you. Motivation comes with, with repetition. Um, but really at, at its core, it's that I can't do everything, but what I can do is I can bring in brilliant people from all walks of life and I can trust them, which is a really hard thing to do, to, to be the experts that they are and utilize their skill sets in order to further this conversation and further our company. And because we have scaled that way, and I do not try to like lie to myself and say, oh, you should know everything about everything, which is, I think a lot of CEOs do. Um, I think that's why we've scaled so quickly. I think that's why we've gone from three people in 2018 to 18 people in 2019, and now we have just topped 30 people. And we launched the company this year. We launched and started doing, uh, started shipping in January, and we made 5 million in the first six months. That's unprecedented. Thank you. Um, but it's because of my team. My team knows what they're doing and I, and I trust them. And, and they trust me to do the things that I know how to do. And, and I don't expect myself to do things that I, I'm not an expert in. And that is a big lesson, I think, particularly for a lot of them-facing folks, um, because we have that imposter syndrome. We have these high expectations that we're supposed to be something that we're not. And the best thing that I can do in this company is lead and rely on the expertise and um, the love and willingness of my employees. Um, and I think the other thing was that I've learned is that um, you can have a company and make all the money you want all day long, but it's nothing unless you have a purpose. If you don't have purpose, then you have unhappy employees, you have no purpose in life. Um, and I constantly ask entrepreneurs like, you know, have you ever considered how your purpose could influence your profit? How helping, helping other folks in the industry could actually help your company instead of trying to, to pat everybody else down and get ahead of the game. Um, so it's, I've learned a lot about altruism. I've learned a lot about um, imposter syndrome and, and just taking a minute to, to rely on those around me and trust those around me. And um, it's, it's been the most, it's probably been the best experience I've ever had in my life. Um, and I've had some pretty interesting experiences. <laughs> um, we're almost out of time. So um, I, I would love to know something that's future facing because we've been talking so much about your journey to get where we are. So. Uh, where you plan to go next or or just what you hope your legacy is um, with everything you're building? Um, we are actually, we are about to, we're, we're, our goal for this year and we're tracking for that goal is to be completely international, fully worldwide um, with this kind of, um, uh, you know, think global, act local kind of approach that, um, you know, in, in each country, in each place that we're in, we're, we're hiring folks in those countries to make sure that we are we're acting locally, like we're actually in compliance with like the local, um, oh, what's the word, like the mannerisms and, and the culture. And, um, you know, instead of bringing like what we think is cool and popular to that country, we're actually abiding by like their local culture. Um, and we've got a lot of products that are coming down the pipeline. We have a 20, 24 month uh, product pipeline 
um, and plan that like this roadmap is insane. Uh, so we have a full line that we're going to be launching um, after these next two products I have coming up that are going to be launched in around September um, that are in that biomimetic family uh, along with Ose, uh, Bachi, and Onda. Um, and they are brilliant they're not my they're not my original idea they were actually the idea of two of our youngest engineers who were 21 and 23 and they were 20 20 and 22 at the time and they're both young amazing and brilliant and i have seen them grow from being just like these terrified like oh i don't even know if i can have a voice in this room to being so empowered and powerful young women and um it's it's really awesome to see and the other thing that we really are are trying to perpetuate is um is that education and in helping everyone, our goal is to actually help everyone to feel a little bit more comfortable in their own bodies, to explore their bodies, to educate themselves so that they feel that kind of empowerment to be able to go out and do great things in the world. Um, because we know that's all linked. Um, so yeah, we've got, we've got a lot of big plans. And if I were going to talk about all of them, we'd definitely run out of time. <laughs> so where can people follow you to find out more and stay in the loop with your launches? Um, if you go to lauradicarlo.com, and that's uh, L-O-R-A-D-I-C-A-R-L-O.com, we're also on social on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, but uh, the company is lauradicarlo underscore HQ, and I'm just laura underscore decarlo. Great. Watch for that news, watch for those drops, and I hope you're all inspired to both uh, level up your personal sexual health and to level up your career and entrepreneurship journey. Thank you so much, Laura. Thank you so much, Sarah. I appreciate it.